Praise the Lord. See, Mike, what happens when you don't open the door until, until 608? <laughs> no one wanted to come tonight. I guess. You scared them all off. That's it. How come they're not here? Because they didn't open the door until late. <laughs> Romans chapter 8. Speaking of late, it just rhymes. Romans chapter 8. Hey, <laughs> the pinnacle, perhaps the the uh, well, it's no surprise nobody's here. This is the most important chapter in the book of Romans, in my opinion. It really, it really is. The photo begats. It's no. This is just. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sorry, is... I'll quit interrupting you. Romans chat. No, it's be my guest. You're on film. It's great. <laughs> Romans chapter 8 uh, re really is, I mean, it, it almost it speaks for itself so well. Uh, but I'm going to just attack it little by little, uh, kind of like we've been doing. <coughs> until Dad took over that one week when I couldn't teach, I wasn't here, and you guys went through like seven chapters. That was a good day. No. <laughs> but slowing back down now, and really you can take your time through this, um, it's, it's incredible. Um, and he's, he, he reaches a conclusion. Really, chapter 8 is right on the back end of of what he's been talking about in chapter 7, especially verse 24 and 25. We could, uh, I'll start there. Romans 7, 24. O oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. Therefore, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ. Now, the title of our message comes from those two words. In Christ. And some of your translations properly let you know that who walk not after the flesh but after the Spirit is added in by uh, manuscripts. It's not in, in the original manuscript. It's uh, added in later. And one of the reasons is he gets to that phrase at the end of verse 4. Um, and so the translators, for some reason, uh, just thought it would be necessary to give it to you right up front. Um, but I like the clarity when you just stop at in Christ Jesus, um, like we did. <laughs> there's, there's clarity that comes, I think, when we just understand there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Um, Paul was just getting to condemning himself. If you, if you catch that, uh, that's how, what we sound like when we're condemning ourselves. Oh, wretched man that I am. Who could save me from this body of death? I stink. I'm, I'm failing over and over and over. And then you get to this conclusion. And it's a heavenly conclusion. It's, it's incredible when you understand, stop and understand what it really means. No condemnation for those who are in Christ. And the two, I think I've said it before, I would argue that the two most important words in the entire Bible are those two words, in Christ what it means to be in Christ. Noah and his family were in the ark. Had they not been in the ark, what would have happened? <laughs> They'd have perished, and actually all of humanity would have. Um, and because, and, and really the ark is an incredible picture of being one who's in Christ. I mean, this is what it's all about. And it's a reason we're not condemned. And he, he kind of uh, uh, explains what it means to be in Christ. Paul continues 
on Romans chapter 8, verse 1. Uh, <laughs> there is no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Verse 2. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God, sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, <coughs> you might note it's and for sin, not and to sin. You know, this is a reason to sin. But this is why God did uh, send Jesus in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, or to make payment for sin, condemned sin in the flesh. That, verse 4, the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Again, reiterated. And it does, like I said, He's, he's explaining what it means to be in Christ. You're no longer in the law. You're no longer walking according to the law. You're now in Christ. And it's huge. Because the law of sin and death condemns us. We would be condemned if it was for the law. Um, the atonement, that's what's brought up in uh, verse 3. God sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh. What is that all about? It's the cross. Again, the power of God is the gospel message. Um, I am not ashamed of the gospel, he said earlier in Romans chapter 1, verse 16. Uh, in this spirit of life, is one of many times in this chapter we're going to see what the uh, Romans chapter 8 brings out um, if you were to count <laughs> Romans chapters 1 through 7 the Holy Spirit or the Spirit is mentioned one time and in this chapter it's all over the chapter the Spirit of life the Holy Spirit the Spirit in fact it's just over and over a theme in Romans chapter 8. Why? Because you can't walk according to your flesh. And guess what? There's no other option. There's no other way. The Holy Spirit is the only way I could walk to please God, walk by faith. It's the Holy Spirit. The ministry of the Holy Spirit is to, again, point us to be in Christ and point us to the cross, ultimately, to the atonement that's brought up. Um, but the spirit of life, I like uh, just how that... The spirit comes to give life. We're going to see the flesh, and we've seen, actually, in Romans chapters 1 through 3 especially, how the flesh brings death. <laughs> Sin, ultimately. If we walk according to the flesh... We're going to gratify the lust of the flesh. We're just going to sin. But if we walk according to the Spirit, we please God. And we, we live life. <laughs> we, we have this abundant life. Jesus, remember John chapter 10, verse 10. Um, I came to give you life and that more abundantly. John 10, 10. For... Uh, the righteousness, and, and like I said, this chapter really speaks for itself. There's not a whole lot to touch on, uh, but when you read, when you got, kind of go through it again, in light of what uh, Paul is getting at, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Again, the contrast that's seen there. Um, you either walk after the flesh or you walk after the Spirit. Uh, and somebody said right, rightfully, not your Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit that's being spoken of here. Capital S. The Spirit. It's, it's not the human Spirit. It's not the Spirit of man. What is it? The Spirit of God. 
For they that walk, uh, or sorry, verse 5 goes on, For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because, and then he explains in verse 7, the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then, they that are in the flesh cannot please God. Again, this is how we please God. It's, it's walking by the Spirit, or walking after the Spirit, the way Paul puts it here. Those that uh, mind the things of the Spirit. Now, this is not the mind like we think, <laughs> when we're thinking, our minds, um, but this is rather the word for mind, or and even in verse 6, carnally minded and spiritually minded, it's how we would say mind, what you have in mind for your, and, and you, you care for your job, you uh, have this in mind for it. It's not necessarily things in your brain that's being spoken of. It's the things that you truly are... Uh, held up with, the things that you, you know, <coughs> are, are busy doing. Uh, a lot of us do this at work. We're, we're totally minded in what's going on. We, have, we can't think about anything else, right? We don't have time to think about something else. We get distracted if we get a phone call or we get the... the you know, it, it takes our mind off of it or something, you know. It, and we start to think differently. So this, um, it really carries the idea of being totally involved with something. Um, and the flesh is totally involved <laughs> with carnal things. To be carnally minded is death, verse 6. Ultimately, it leads to death. Well, what does it mean to be carnally minded? It means... Leaving the Bible study to take a phone call. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> what does it mean to be carnally minded? It means you're talking and thinking about things that are empty. And, and fleshly, ultimately. What is the flesh? What is the flesh? It's, what are we going to eat? <laughs> Where are we going to go? Jesus said, <laughs> don't worry about what to wear. Or what you will eat, right? The the God takes care of the flowers, the the birds of the air, and we spend so much money and resources and time and energy on stuff that just is carnal. It's just fleshly. I can't stand it. You know, you you try and plan something with the family, or you try and do something spontaneously. And, well, we got to make sure we plan and pack for this and this and this and this. Can we just go? <coughs> what are you going to do when the rapture takes place? Well, i got to make sure i got this and i got this and i got that. That's carnally minded. That's, that's things that are just... And, and I, I think I made the reference chili con carnal, right? It's just meaty. It's fleshy. It's, it's stuff that's here. You're right. It's tangible. We know it'll be here where we left it, you know. And, and we're, we are practical. Our minds, our are, uh, very nature is to go after those things. We have a knack for the tangible the, the, and for saving and for storing up <laughs> and for all of that stuff, you know. We hold on to things naturally, don't we? We really do. We hold on to things that are sentimental to us. Don't mess with those things. Nope. <laughs> don't touch those things. God don't want you in that closet. You can have this whole part of me, but when it comes to that, no, that's, that's me. And God changes us from the inside out. Amen. I find myself carnally minded minute by minute, second by second, getting involved 
with things that just ultimately are a dead end. They bring death. To be carnally minded is death. How to commit that to memory, right? <laughs> but there's a big uh, contrast here, right? But to be spiritually minded, note this, to be spiritually minded, the end of verse 6, is life. Not to be spiritually minded will lead to life one day. Not to be spiritually minded, it will get you on the right path to that. No, to be spiritually minded right now is life. And, if that wasn't enough, peace. It is life and peace. That's why you walk around with that goofy grin on your face. <laughs> your hair's on fire, bro! <clears throat> Praise God. You know, you got this big grin on your face. Don't you know that the, the world's falling apart around us? Praise the Lord. <laughs> peace that passes all human understanding. A peace that truly will drive the world crazy. And it does. They wonder, how in the world can... Those people of all different ages and races and sizes and, and every different background, how in the world are they under the same roof, caring for each other, putting others' needs before their own? We baffle the minds of those who are in power <laughs> that spend billions and trillions of dollars on trying to create this from the flesh. And it, it will lead to nothing. Uh, we'll probably not get there tonight, but there's a whole lot you can get into when you get when you find it when we get down to it's not just us. It's not just human beings. But that's what's neat about Romans eight. We're gonna see the whole creation verse twenty two. That's that's probably for next week, but <laughs> the whole creation groans. It's not just you. It's not just me. It's the trees. It's the ocean. It's the, the animals. <laughs> all, all of creation. The whole creation. Well, no. I know what creation needs to be redeemed. I know what needs to happen. We just need a le little less carbon footprint, right? That'll take care of all of it. And you can get caught up getting carnally minded and it's it's you could say well no you're being too spiritual but see Paul well that's what's so, so radical it really is radical Romans chapter 8 and that's why I said it's it's the most important chapter in my opinion in the book of Romans because it causes you to see oh there's the flesh and there's the spirit and there's people all around us who emphasize, talk about, promote the flesh constantly. <laughs> and then there's Jesus. And I'll just say Him. <laughs> because He alone really brings life. The Spirit. <laughs> and that's why the Spirit, the Holy Spirit says, look at Him. <laughs> look at Jesus, because Jesus... That shows you the Heavenly Father. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. You, you know it's all about Him, right? In Christ. It's all wrapped up. The title of the message, right? In Christ. That's what it's all about. And the law of God is made perfect in Christ. You know, the law before... If, if we would try to keep the law, you know kind of keeping things in context, if you tried to keep the law in the power of your flesh, you, it's, there is no hope there. And what Romans chapter 8 points out, among many other things, is that in Christ, the law is totally fulfilled. In fact, we have no obligation if we're in Christ. Not only no condemnation, but no obligation. That's verses 9 through 17. You think we can make it? I don't know. Let's see. <laughs> but ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. Verse 9. If so, be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. 
Now if any man uh, have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin. But the Spirit is life. There it is again. Because of righteousness. Whose righteousness? <laughs> Who do you think? God. Christ. Right on. Jesus. I know it's not mine. <laughs> it's not none of my righteousness. So, verse 11. But if the Spirit of Him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, He that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by His Spirit that dwelleth in you. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh, to live after the flesh, but, or, sorry, verse 13, for if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. Kind of a oxymoron to the common mind. Put uh, the deeds of the flesh to death, and then you'll live. You know, uh, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Verse 15, for ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Daddy, Father, Abba. Abba is literally translated, Daddy. The most affectionate words you can hear from your kids and uh, verse 16, the Spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God. There's something you can never fully comprehend. An heir of God. You're, you're working with God. Stay tuned, you'll be ruling and reigning with Christ and with God. I mean, that'll blow your mind right there. And joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with Him. There's a big if, right? If we suffer with Him, that we may be also glorified together. We'll stop there tonight, but a big enough chunk to chew on, for sure. This section lets you and I know that, hey, it's no obligation on my part. In other words, Christ has done it all. This is what it means. Christ be in you. Verse 10, right? Like we read. If Christ be in you, then guess what? The body is dead because of sin. Does that mean you don't ever sin? No. I wish. Yeah. But no. No. That's not it. We all know that, that we, we still sin. But, verse 10 goes on. The spirit of life, because of righteousness, that's what Christ brings. Again, it's Christ's righteousness, it's, it's Christ who lives in me. And that same spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead. Now, verse 11 is kind of neat. For those that have a hard time with the Trinity, I didn't do my homework, I should have, but it just reminded me just now of a proof that the Trinity, and you could take this verse, Romans 8, 11, how it says very clearly the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead. And you could look at other passages and see the Father raised up Jesus from the dead. And then you say, see another passage that says, Jesus Christ Himself raised Himself from the dead. And you get baffled. You say, which is it? Did it, the Father, did the Son, or did the Holy Spirit raise Jesus? And the answer is yes. <laughs> to all three, right? By the Scriptures. And another just kind of uh, great proof of that whole uh, doctrine of the Trinity. And it's, it's throughout the Bible, but that's just one uh, example there. But that same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. Again, this is how we are in Christ. The title of the message, In Christ. How could that be? The Holy Spirit dwells in you. 
Christ it dwells in you. This is huge. Again, this is fundamental Christianity where we understand it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. It's very basic, but we need to be reminded of it, don't we? Am I the only one? No. no. <laughs> we need to be reminded of these. Now, it's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. For they that are in the flesh cannot please God, we read in verse 8, Romans 8, 8. They that are in the flesh still cannot please God. And I love the way that he puts it in chapter, in, uh, sorry, chapter 8, verse 12. Romans 8, 12. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh. Nowhere in the Bible will you see promoting making your flesh better. It's not in the Bible. And yet, that's what we are obsessed with in our culture. Even in the church. A lot of us, right? We've got to exercise. Now, I'm not putting any of that down. But we focus so much on it. We've got to go jogging. We've got to exercise. We've got to make this flesh and I, I always go back to my Bible college days in the name of the gym. You know, we had a little workout room, and the name over the gym was Prophets Little. It's very true. Now, is it good to exercise? Absolutely. Is it, you know, good to eat right? To, to take care of your flesh? But see, you're not told in the Bible to take care of your flesh. Why not? Because you don't need to be told that. We already do it by nature, don't we? We already do it by nature. Are you in debt to your flesh? Because you sure live like it. That's what Paul's saying. What do you owe your flesh something? That you're living? And the whole idea is, I like how one teacher put it. If I have this bowl of ice cream, it's right here, you can see it, right? And I eat that thing, you no longer see it. That ice cream's in me. And the flesh that we once had should be hidden. It shouldn't be seen by everybody. Rather, Christ should be on display, right? I'm in Christ. The flesh is gone. One day, it's going to be all gone. Amen. But we should be walking in such a way, like he says, we walk after the Spirit, not after the flesh. We're not minding the things of the flesh, the cares of the world, the stuff that's going on. And you're getting enamored daily to think about it. <laughs> to th wake up in the morning, and this is what you've got on your mind. Somebody said, with Facebook, it was a really good quote. It's, this is the first time in human history, in all of history, where there's a gathering of multitudes. Fa Facebook, and I'm not, I have a Facebook, I'm not knocking it. I'm just saying, this is the first time, and we have a whole generation of people that gather together with absolutely no purpose at all. See, throughout history... People gather together like we do tonight. There's a purpose for it. We're here for something. People gather every morning at, at a workplace, and it's, there's a purpose for it. And if you are like me, <laughs> and wake up, and you look at that purposeless Facebook feed, where there is no purpose, what do you think that does throughout your whole day? You, you begin to take on this kind of, I have no purpose. And we have a whole generation of people that are walking and living in such a way they have no purpose. And they believe it. They believe they have no purpose. Because they've been told beyond that that they came from an animal. There's a root cause to all of it. And so we, it's no wonder we're the most depressed generation of all. The most, uh, you know, all the medications and, and 
just billions of dollars that are going towards things that ultimately, what is it? It's a spiritual issue. It's a spiritual issue. That's ultimately what it is. You can get into a conversation about this with somebody, about some political view that others might hold. But guess what? Behind all of it, underneath all of it, is a spiritual issue. It's wrong to murder a baby in the womb. There's no getting around that, folks. It's wrong to, to tell people that they came from animals. Or, beyond that, that this whole world, everything around us, the universe just kind of came into existence. And, and we have scientific proof that this is what happened. <laughs> Science has been hijacked from the Christians. Do your research and find out who invented science. It's Christians. Science does not baffle this book. It does not put this book down in any way. In fact, it complements it. True science. You hear a lot about science, don't you? And, and actual, factual science, it, over and over and over again, it, it is uh, proving the Bible more and more. And not just science, but history in the same way. Uh, I don't know how I got off on all that, but anyways. Spiritual issues, right? The Spirit. The Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead. In, in, uh, in other words, that same Spirit, well, verse 11 as we read, dwells in you and makes you alive. You know, to live. Not after the flesh, but through the Spirit put to death the deeds of the flesh, mortify the deeds of the body, and you will live. Verse 13, right? And I like verse 14. We have this phrase that Paul throws in that uh, the Apostle John later loves to use. For Verse 14, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are what? The sons of God. And John, 1 John 1, or 3, 1 John chapter 3, verse 1. Behold what manner of love the Father has lavished on us, that we would be called the sons of God. That you and I could be, and he takes it further and says, we've been received not with bondage to fear, but the spirit of adoption, verse 15. And we now cry, Abba, Father. He's our Father. Too many times when we pray, and there's nothing wrong with saying, you know, Lord Jesus, or God, or help. There's nothing wrong with any of that. But it's interesting that Jesus himself, when teaching us how to pray, said, you ought to pray our, what? Father. When we go before the Lord, don't. This is the Spirit that guides us into life. He it's the very spirit of adoption that gives you the unction, gives you the, the, uh, the right to cry out, Daddy, Father, our Father. In fact, the only time in the Scripture that Jesus didn't call Him Father was when He was carrying your sins. Carrying the sins of all the world. Psalm chapter 22, He cried out from the cross. Jesus cried out, what? My God. My God. He never called Him God. He always, Jesus always called Him Father. In that close relationship, that unity, that oneness that they, that they experience, that He is. And as soon as He takes the sin, it's no wonder when we cry, we tremble sometimes. God... If you're there, it's because we're full of sin. <laughs> we have that same distance. We have that, that feeling. And what does it say? To, the book of Isaiah says, your iniquities have separated you from God. And you feel separated. 
and the Holy Spirit comes in you, all of a sudden, I have a Father that not only treats me right, but loves me, <laughs> loves me to death. <coughs> Literally, you know, He... It's just incredible when you, when you see how, uh, again, how when we're in the flesh, when we're sinful, we, we begin to get separated. There's this separation that takes place. Maybe we are not even aware of it. This, this separation that happens. But be in prayer. Address Him as your Father. You know, Don't be a legalistic about it. But don't be afraid to say, Father, you're in heaven. You're listening. Holy is your name. You know, your kingdom come, as Jesus continued to teach us. But verse 16, the Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs. Just like the inheritance, we're getting into the blessings and on Sunday mornings in the book of Genesis. Just like, you know, Isaac would take in and, and take and step into Abraham's shoes, his father. Jacob would step in, take the place of uh, Isaac, his father. Joseph, and now we're going to see Joseph's two sons that step in and kind of take this inheritance. These children, they become heirs and joint heirs. And for Jacob, that was a lot of children, right? Twelve children. But that's the thing, to be in this work together, or rather, not work, in this family, together. God loves to use the family. <clears throat> the picture of a man and a woman had a little baby. Yes, they did. And now there's three in the family. Except for Mikey and Alex's case. Four. <laughs> but, God, but God designs this thing to show us a picture of Him. A picture of Him. How truly He is our Father. How truly He has a Son. And His Son desires you to be, and I hope you are, the bride of Christ. Right? And we're to be bearing fruit. We're to be bringing forth, being fruitful and filling the earth. Being fruitful and multiplying. So go forth, go into all the world. Fill the world with the gospel spiritually, right? It's a spiritual thing, Mikey. It's not fill the earth with children and, and just <laughs> keep going. No. Speak for yourself, sir. There's a spiritual. God, God uh, desires this with us, and we are joint heirs with Christ. What does that mean? Christ died so that people could come and spend eternity in heaven. What will you do? Will you tell someone, hey, there's a God that loves you? There's, there's a man named Jesus Christ that died on the cross for your sins. That guilt that you're walking around with, it doesn't need to be there. There's an answer for it. it hasn't changed in thousands and thousands of years. It hasn't changed Jesus is the answer to all of life's big mysteries. And we have all these things that come along and confuse us or try and take our eyes off. It's just flesh. It's just carnal. Just keep your eyes on Jesus Christ. It's Him. Amen. Be in Christ. And it, it just is amazing how truly He brings life. All that other stuff just brings death, it brings confusion, it brings... Well, that, that's what condemnation means. It's, it's in, the very word is a verdict of guilty. Lay, bringing down a verdict, that means that you are guilty. And John 3, 17, the one that everyone stops at. You know, everyone knows John 3, 16. But John 3, 17, you could jot that down. Next to Romans 8, verse 1. Because it says, God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that through, the world, <coughs> through Him, the world would be saved. And just like He told the woman at, uh, caught in adultery, rather, 
the woman that was caught in adultery, and they all said in John chapter 8, verse 10 and 11, what, you know, what should we do with her? She should be stoned to death, right? And Jesus said, started writing in the sand, and when they heard him, he, he would ask her, where's your accusers? She says, there's none. And he said, neither do I condemn you. John 8, 11. Jesus did not come to bring condemnation. There truly is no condemnation in Christ Jesus. Why is there no condemnation in Christ Jesus? Among many other things, Jesus Christ has taken our sins and forgotten all about them. Psalms chapter 1, 103. Psalms 103, verse 12. It says this. I love, this is a huge one. We sing a song that goes like this. Psalm 103, verse 12. As far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. What are transgressions? Sins. And even, it, it even blesses you more when you understand it's sins you know you shouldn't do. Right. I always think of the no, because transgressions kind of sounds like trespasses. And the no trespassing sign. When you see that sign, you know you're not supposed to go, and yet you go trespassing. Transgressions, that's, what, that's the, the definition of it. And so he, he takes those transgressions and... Uh, as far as the east is from the west. Well, that's how far is that? You know, there's got to be an end to that. No. Once you start going east enough, you start going this, and you just can't get away from each other. You can never out, uh, outdo God, right? And then Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews 10, 17 says, Your sins and your iniquities will I remember no more. Really Hebrews 10, 17. I don't know how God does that because I can't. All I remember are people's sins. People are in hospitals, psych wards, because all they remember are people's sins. You see how Jesus is the answer? <laughs> Yet, He remembers your sin personally. Don't worry about them out there. He will remember your sins no more. That scripture, if, if nothing else, that should get you walking out with a smile on your face tonight. <laughs> he will remember your sins no more. Amen? Amen. It sure does me. <laughs> I love it. Father, we thank you for your word tonight. Just how powerful this chapter is. Lord, Romans 8. Just the showing us what it means to live in the Spirit, Lord not to walk after the lust of the flesh, not to gratify the pleasures of the flesh, Lord, not to dwell on carnal things, Lord, but to keep our eyes on You. Help us to start out our day in Christ, Lord, to work and to throughout our day be in Christ and end every day in Christ, that we would truly be men and women that are in Christ. God, that you would be on display for all to see as we just walk through this world, as we just fight the battles, for there are many. Lord, we thank you and praise you that we can be in Christ. 